All right, thanks for staying with us on the show. And uh, if to many people, the year is winding down. To some others, it's like Christmas is around the corners. While another school of thought would be like, even before Christmas, we're witnessing a lot of rise in costs of, you know, things generally, commodities. Uh, but this morning, we want to narrow it down to food in the country and take a look at the cost of living and the impact on Christmas, New Year market on Nigerians. The National Bureau of Statistics had revealed that the food inflation for the month of October stood at 23.72%, which was, of course, higher from that uh, in September. Uh, we stood at 23.34% in this year, 2022. And so the steep rise in cost of you know, food items would affect families generally because even before Christmas, David, we still have to feed. So what impact would this have on families, on the nation at large? These are the things we want to take a look at this morning yeah. on this segment of the show. Yes, an, imp an important conversation we must have at this point in time of the year. Inflation at 21.09%, with food inflation being the, the, the major component uh, that has brought about that rise in uh, uh, inflation figures. Um, when we talk about food inflation, we are looking at... Uh, what are the components that brought about the rise in uh, uh, food inflation? You can't take away uh, concerns around security. You can't take away concerns around um, power and energy, uh, cost of transportation and all of that. Anyways, we would not be the experts on the show uh, today as we have our experts waiting uh, to join us right about now. Kevin Emanuel is now Buja Studio. Uh, Kevin Emanuel is, uh, is a business analyst. Uh, uh, so good to have you on the program, uh, Kelvin. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay, I hope we can get the sound right. Again, good morning, uh, Kevin. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. All right, fantastic, fantastic. We also have joining us via Zoom. We have Vicente Shoma, who is the head capital market, Interstate Securities Limited. Uh, Vicente, our uh, longest time. So good to have you on the program again. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. Fantastic. Yes, gentlemen, let's do justice to this conversation around um, the prices of food, uh, food in the market uh, relative to uh, inflation figures. We are still looking, we're still expecting the latest inflation figures uh, pretty soon. Uh, when you speak with experts like you, the, the, the perspective, uh, the speculation is that um, the figures are, might likely still go up. Uh, look into the fundamentals. So let me start off with you, uh, Vincent Toshoma. Uh, what would be your speculations for uh, the inflation figures, uh, uh, the latest, the, the, ex the ones we're expecting uh, going forward? Let's start off with that. Yes, thank you very much. If you look at the, the factors that has brought us to where we are with respect to food inflation, so the general inflation, we're talking about the, the insecurity in the in north we especially in north central the food belt of the nation and also in the northwest then you talk about uh, logistic challenges in terms of structural deficit movement cost of moving um, these goods to where they are needed also you talk about an uh, imported part of the inflation as a result of the uh, increase in forex a lot of uh, food is still being imported as well as um look energy issues we have uh, 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 shortages in terms of the uh, poor supply in the country. So when you look at these factors that have brought us to where we are, I think going forward is expected to rise. Though it may, we may not see it rising, increase as uh, before, but because we have noticed that there have been a, a reduction, month to month reduction in terms of the uh, inflation figures, but it's still expected to rise. Coupled with the fact that recently we also had a flooding issue in the midst of the harvest. Uh, but by this period, we are supposed to be having a food and a, in the terms of inflation figures because we are in the harvest season. But when you now have a the harvest that has been impacted by flood, I think uh, we should not expect it to cool down as, as we would have been uh, expected. But uh, so uh, we should expect the figures to increase, though we may not see uh, a steep increase as we have been. Yes. Let's 
come to you. There were projections for food inflation for the year 2022, which many people had prayed wouldn't happen. <laughs> but there, because of realities that we had on ground, uh, those stakeholders had their eyes to how things would pan out. For instance, uh, food um, inflation prices were predicted uh, between 9.5 to 10.5 percent. And food total prices are uh, predicted to increase between 11.0 and 12.0 percent. But all of these, even including the food away from home prices, predicted to increase at seven, uh, between 7 and 8 percent, are things that many people on, on the street would be like, Okay, you're churning out figures to me, but how do these really translate to what I do every day? How do you explain to people uh, around who are watching right now who do not understand the technical jargons as to how business works, uh, so to speak, and how uh, this inflation from here and there uh, affect what the cost of what they buy per time? Can you please break it down for an average person watching us this morning, Kevin? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, it's it's not very easy to break it down for the people um, out there, other than the fact that um, the government has made very um, ill-timed and um, if to permit the use of the word irresponsible policies in terms of monetary and fiscal policies over the last. Um, several years, and I'll give you I'll give you a typical example. So the closure of the border, and the restriction of the importation on maize, and the fact that the government decided to place um, restricted give waivers to six companies to bring in maize, costs like an acceleration in the price of animal feeds, for example. Yeah, we, you can see that in the last three years, um, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe in the last seven years, the price of um, poultry feeds has gone up, which is the most um, consumed and popular segment in animal feed category, has gone up by 384%. And that has affected things like um, chicken, because the more the price of feed goes up, it's gone up from like 2007 to 9,004. The more the price of feed goes up, the higher the price of chicken, the higher the price of eggs. So people notice that over the last seven years, the price of chicken has gone up from somewhere around 900 naira, 800 naira per kilo, to over 2,000 naira, 2,004, 2,500 naira per kilo. The price of a crate of egg has also gone up from somewhere around eight, seven hundred naira per crate to somewhere around two thousand five. Some parts of Lagos selling for two thousand seven, two thousand eight hundred naira. It's because of the price of chicken uh, feeds, and the price of feed is because of the price of maize and soybean. Because maize and soybean is seventy percent of the composition of making feeds. Nigerians will also notice that the price of um, cooking gas has gone up from um, somewhere around 250 naira per kg to somewhere around 900 naira per kg. Yeah, because 70% of the LPG that is used in Nigeria is imported from Equatorial Guinea and from the United States of America. Despite the fact that Nigeria has huge deposits of natural gas and Nigeria has the ninth largest proven reserves of natural gas in the world. The question I usually like to ask is, look, for a city of, like Lagos that has 22 million people in it, 52% of Lagosians earn between 50 and 70,000 naira monthly. How will the average Lagosian afford cooking gas that sells averagely between 11,000 naira and 12,000 naira for a 12 kg of cooking gas? If they can't afford it, I'll give you another instance. The price of a liter of kerosene, DPK, dual purpose kerosene, has gone up from 83 naira per liter to 947 naira per liter within the last seven years because kerosene was one of the things that was deregulated. And the drop in naira is affecting the price of um, the landing cost of kerosene to Nigeria. And it retails for over 1,000 naira. Electronic and digital banking relies on telephone signals and coverage. Yeah, you have 100 and 
you have 17 ATMs, 147 POS machines, and four bank branches per 100,000 Nigerians. This is the hard data on the ground. This is what I'm asking the Central Bank of Nigeria. How do you intend to, in this age of uh, fiscal uh, monetary tightening and accelerating inflation and lower purchasing power and high food prices, how do you intend to inflict more pain on Nigerians by implementing the current policy of um, limit on withdrawals and the current NARA redesign? And I, I, and I dare to say that we've not seen the last of policy announcements on this withdrawal um, NARA redesign. We've not seen the last of it. This is not the last. Anyways, um, Kelvin, you, you have, you have uh, expanded the conversation, no doubt. Uh, which is always um, a good thing whenever we have you on, on, on conversations like this. L let me throw uh, the question now to Vincent. Uh, Vincent, you have listened to all uh, the concerns and the data that uh, Kevin had reeled out. Uh, what would you think uh, uh, should be our line of conversation right now uh, going forward into this festive season uh, in terms of um, how do we begin to bring down this inflationary pressure that is uh, that become a dragon to the nation's economy. That for me is key. Uh, what should you think should be our conversations at this moment? There's a lack of coordination between the fiscal and the monetary policy managers. I think that has been uh, a major issues because you see the uh, on that thing, uh, you see the fiscal policies. We have not really seen much in terms of uh, uh, movement from the fiscal policy in terms of managing inflation of pressures and price pressures. So you see the CBN keep reacting because, the, you see, to a greater extent, can actually because of uh, the impact that we have in this country, largely in the uh, in, in, uh, large informal sector. I think the policies of the CBN have not really had an impact. Outside the policy of the CBN reducing rates, we have not really seen much of impact. Uh, outside that policy, we have also noticed that a lot of the policy announcement by the CBN is reactionary. They, they come not, uh, they don't move as expect, as fast as expected. When you look at the rate reduction, the uh, increase in rates, a lot of the, uh, we have seen a lot of increase in rates in order from before we see the CBN, before we saw the CBN take the first move in May. So most times they tend to not play a catch up and some of those policies, because of a lack of coordination, we have not really seen the impact. Because the other thing I would also like to mention is the fact that we understand those factors. When you hear the CBN and the fiscal policy talking, we understand the factors. Some things, something have to be done with respect to the, those factors that are pushing this inflation. Like a very quick example, a common thing is that this uh, scarcity of petroleum. We all know that this is going to feed that into the price of goods and commodities because when there's scarcity of petroleum products and we see people buying it at a high price of between 200 and 300 people are not getting a lot of people are not getting it at the official price even getting it at the official price is very difficult so people go for those prices uh, in the black market too and even some police stations are selling at above uh, 200 so that will feed into the cost of transportation i know that uh, a lot of goods has been transported by road so, and that result to increase in the cost of transporting these goods, which means that these goods will be arriving at a high price. And we also know that this period is a period that there will be a lot of uh, 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 people who go for those goods because of the festive season. So that means that we are expecting increase in the inflation figures because of what is currently happening. So if there is any movement that is about solving this problem, there are some short-term uh, problems that can be solved, and there are some Term. So if you don't continue, we continue to avoid taking steps in the right direction, both for the short term and the long term problem challenges, we will continue to have issues like this. Because the we, most time we keep talking about the insecurity in in the uh, in the north that discussing this problem. This problem have stayed with us for a long time, and we have not really seen reduction. And because sometimes some of these impact of these uh, uh, crises, they don't come in immediately. I think that's why we don't see more reaction from the government, like the flooding issue. But we are not going to see much of the impact right now. But as we go in, the build, uh, go into the new year, we we'll start seeing because we're in the harvest season, so we may still be seeing some harvest. 
But when if harvest that were supposed to be uh, harvested and stored to some extent are not, they are not going to be available. When we exhaust the one that have been harvested, when the storage, there will not be an issue. So some of those are some of the issues that we continue to have. So unless we see reaction and the coordination between the fiscal policies and the monetary policy managers, we will continue to have these challenges. I'll give you a good example that was so good. When the uh, CB, uh, the uh, uh, Minister of Finance came and said she's not aware of the of the redesigning of the Naira. And this is a major policy by the CBN. Yes, the CBN has the, the independence to, in terms of, uh, as long as they get the presidential approval. But I think the uh, fiscal policy managers should be carried along so that they can get, be, there will be some coordination because all these policies that they are announcing has both the positive effect and a negative effect. So if you don't factor in the factors that the negative effect will bring in, then you will have a further increased problem in other areas. So I think there is need for coordination between the fiscal and the monetary policy, and we need more action by the not reactionary policies, not reactionary move, but proactionary move for us to solve the myriads of challenges that we have going much, uh, Vincent. L let me come back to you, Kelvin, at this point in time. Uh, Christmas is around the corner all over the world. You, you see families are uh, preparing to have, you know, a dinner, I want to have a good time. In fact, in this part of the country, in, in some families will have to do like ward round of uh, maybe uh, extended families. So really, you know, thank God for uh, the year end, looking forward to a new year. And when you take a look, for instance, what uh, Vincent said earlier on with regards to the fuel scarcity and how it's biting hard. I want to imagine to the finances of some people who might have saved up some money towards Christmas will have to move around and will have to buy the commodity at a higher price, which they didn't envisage would happen at this time of the year. In what ways can families cope through this season, Kelvin? Well, um, to be honest with you, this is not, uh, there are no easy answers. If I tell you I have an easy answer to the question, I'll be, I'll be lying to you. Um, I would like to remind Nigerians that in 2012, they missed out on an opportunity to ensure that Nigeria did not lose out consistently on trillions of naira in questionable subsidy claims. Today, we have the elephant in the room. And the reality is that currently in Lagos, I think, and Papa, the depot price on PMS is between 240 and 250 naira per liter. The government is, the finances of the government are not in order. Uh, debt to GDP is um, somewhere around 24%. Um, the interest on GDP is 1.75%. The government is having to pay 118 cover per 100 cover of revenue it gets in debt servicing. The government just doesn't have the money to pay for subsidy. And the government is reluctant to come out to Nigerians openly and admit that, look, guys, we're broke. We can't pay for subsidy. And we might have to remove the subsidy in phases. And the reason is because it's political. You're going, you're less than two months away from a general election, a very consequential one. If the government removes subsidy, it's afraid that it might have backlash. But the reality is that how can you place the future of the, uh, of the economy of Nigeria um, ahead of uh, your know, sort of political calculations ahead of the future of the economy of the country. Now, let me come back to the reality on the ground. Nigerians need to accept. You have to choose. Do you want consistent supply of PMS or do you want fuel scarcity at the subsidized price? It's a choice that people have to make. Unfortunately, th these are not easy um, answers to give. But this is the reality of the situation. We have to live and accept the fact that Nigeria has one of the lowest petrol prices in Africa. We have to live with it. The only parts of the world where you have petrol prices very low was in Gaddafi's um, um, Libya, in countries in the Gulf, in the GCC, where petrol is heavily subsidized and population is under 20 million, usually. Yeah. Those are the places where you have very low petrol prices. Petrol prices, Nigerians have to deal with the reality that it, when the subsidy is removed, the average, the lowest price of petrol you will see is 400 naira per liter. So we have to pick <laughs> what we want. 
do you want continued uh, crisis of scarcity? Uh, or do you want to pay fair value? This is the reality of the situation. Unfortunately, it's, it's difficult because um, our purchasing power, like I said earlier, has been diminished seriously because of the drop in um, Naira. And um, the income has just not gone up. In fact, in the last seven years, the per capita income of Nigeria has actually dropped from $30,099 to $2,100. That's a 47% depreciation in the last seven years. So the, the income of the uh, 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 purchasing power of Nigeria has actually dropped because of a drop in the per capita income. Yeah, and the, the, the income levels have stayed, stayed steady. It hasn't, hasn't gone up. So, and this is also because employers in Nigeria are facing very tough, tough business environment, tough regulatory environment, tough business environment, you know, and it's not easier anywhere. So we have to live and deal with the reality that we can either have continuous fuel scarcity and all of the issues that come with fuel scarcity for the prices, the artificial prices, yeah, or we can decide to um, ask the government to lift off the subsidy on petrol and have steady supply of PMS. And this also goes to the exchange rate. It, well, number one, you have the artificial exchange rate, government subsidized exchange rate that it gives to people who are close to government and in government. Then you have the real market that where um, a willing buyer and a willing seller decides to exchange and where you have fair value. The same thing. You know, uh, Kelvin, you just painted a, a picture right now, and uh, one begins to wonder which way, which way Nigeria. That's the question uh, everyone will be asking going, going forward. But then, it is not all gloomy. Um, one could also say uh, part of the concerns uh, could also be around revenue. Uh, luckily, we could see that uh, we have ramped up our production on crude. 1.18 billion, uh, a million dollar, I mean, million barrels per day was the latest figure that we got. So just maybe we could smile at that, that uh, we could be having more uh, revenue going forward. However, that does not uh, rule out the fact that the subsidy conversation is one that should be brought to the fore and taken a lot more, more seriously. Um, let me speak with you, Vincent. Yes, um, like my colleague did ask, it's Christmas season and what happens during Christmas is there's increased spending. Uh, there's expectations that there will be uh, pressure pressure on the market, pressure on commodities. Uh, let's look at how that would also impact the inflationary figures uh, going forward, uh, Vincent. Yes, definitely, like, like I mentioned, the, the inflationary figures will definitely be impacted because uh, the factors that, are, that have been pushing the inflationary figures are still very much with us, coupled with the fact that uh, during this um, festive season, we'll see increased spending. And you are talking about increased spending now at a higher cost. So I think it's definitely going to affect the inflation figures that will be read out at, uh, uh, at this, for this period. So, uh, and it's unfortunate because it means that uh, the festive season, the celebration of this period will be affected for the average Nigerian. And the con continuous reduction in the purchasing power of the average Nigerian, because as we are seeing increased pressure, uh, pressure uh, increase in prices, we have not seen increase in income of the average Nigeria. And also, it will increase the number of Nigerians that have below the poverty line. You know, the last figure said that we have about 100 million Nigerians that are poor. So, with this uh, price pressure, we are going to see increase in that figure because we are not seeing an increase in the income. And, uh, it's quite unfortunate. And like uh, uh, Kevin mentioned, it's a very challenging situation. It's, you know, there's no easy way out. But it's just that some hard decision has to be made for us to be able to push through this time. But unfortunately, we are approaching the election season where it, uh, it is difficult for the, the government to make those hard decisions. But the government just, just have to make it because there may be a backlash if those decisions are not, are not made. Recently, we, we saw the DSS uh, 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 announcing some uh, threats. If uh, nothing is done, even a uh, 
automate something like an ultimatum to the NMPC and also to marketers to do something about the uh, world challenges because it has a security impact. So some decisions have to be made. Because, but the, unfortunately, the mandate, the, the announcement by the DSS, I don't think it will have much impact because you have the NMPC that is still very much on that in control of the government. So it's just like giving that information to the government to do something. The marketers, will, uh, the NMPC is still the major importer of oil in the country. So it is well, and it still controls the distribution and network and everything. So the NMPC has a lot, the NMPC has a lot to do. So it's just for the uh, government, especially the president and also the minister of state of the children, to do something about the, these current challenges that we are having. Because if nothing is done, we have, like the DSS mentioned, we have security challenges in our hands because there's a limit to how much you can push the poor. Because these issues we are having, poor scarcity, inflationary pressure, the people that bear the impact the most, most people, the very Nigerians. So if you don't do something about them, that means there is a, there can be a social so a social impact on it and social reaction, which will be very, very unfortunate and yeah. we may affect the elections that we are. So I think something has to be done. Some uh, bold decision has to be made and we have to prioritize the economy above uh, Everything. Uh, politics uh, and right. uh, other things. Vincent, I'll, I'll stay with you on this one. Let's take a look at first and foremost, um, you know, citizens of this country who just know as much as ordinary citizens do, you know, as to the uh, newly announced cash um, withdrawal limit policy of the Central Bank of Nigeria, of Nigeria and its uh, impact that you envisage on the people of the country when it starts, uh, you know, operation uh, from the 9th of January 2023. What are you looking forward to? What are your concerns? And in what way do you support or oppose this policy, Vincent? And then the same will go to you also, Kelvin. When, when, when you look at this policy, there are some uh, positive side to the policy because uh, I think uh, the, the reaction, because when you look the positive side to the policy, the fact that CBN is trying to bring a lot of people into the former system, trying to bring a lot of Nigerians into the former, and also to encourage more Nigerians to adopt this uh, technology, some of this uh, 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 transformed uh, technology that have been adopted, that have been, been promoted by the CBN. Recently, we talked about the e naira that was being adopted, and CBN has been doing a lot to try and promote it, even in the informal sector, too, because a lot of persons cannot uh, make transfer on the with the inner using the ussd code and also with the uh mobile money uh, ad adoption behind it, bringing the telecom companies into the mobile and peer giving them license i think they are trying to push more nigerians to adopt these uh, measures so when you look at that area of it you can say that it's possible because for me i remember when the cashless policy was being pushed by the former cbn there was a lot of reaction but after a while we saw a lot of nigerians adopting it so those are the positive side i can say to it so it will lead to more nigerians adopting this technology being pushed by the government and also for us to be cashless which is the positive side but when you now look at the downside of it like uh, kevin mentioned i think the government should look at it and how to cushion the impact it will have especially people that are on people that are in the rural areas with respect to technology i think well, for data uh, data penetration, I think we may be low on that. But I think a lot of Nigerians, especially those who may adopt it by using their phones, we have a lot of uh, in terms of voice penetration. I think a lot of Nigerians are mo we have more Nigerians in that area. So and with the USSD code, I think they will be able to make a lot of transfer. But I think the major challenge for me that I will, is the fact that this transfer is free. So something has to be done with respect to the cost of making this transfer as well. And also, we have to also look at the cyber say, threats, the security of this transfer, because sometimes we have seen some persons taking advantage of transfer. I think that's what one of Nigerians and having with adopting this cashless policy. We see a lot of fraud in this policy, people taking advantage of people's uh, phones and other states. So and because of uh, the challenges some persons have with really, I think they are concerned about adopting those things. They still have to do, they prefer cash. There's less security, there's more security with respect to cash. So oh. I think those are that the CB government has to look at 
to uh, assuage the fears of Nigerians and encourage. It is true. There are a lot to me that needs to be done in terms of infrastructure. All right, Vincent. But I have Let's, seen policies okay. like this push infrastructure development and talk about the POS. When the cashless policy started, there was less adoption of POS. But with time, we have seen more adoption of POS. I think this will help. We actually push growth in the system. All I right. think that's what the CBN is looking uh, for. Th th thank you, Vincent. Uh, Kelvin, what do you think? Um, you know, I, I mentioned my, I, I, I shared my position earlier on the withdrawal policy. I've always been against the Naira redesign and the withdrawal policy. I think the CBN has more important issues to deal with than to focus on these peripheral issues. For me, I believe that you can't force financial inclusion. You have to incentivize financial inclusion. For you to get into insurance, savings, payments, transactions, and um, credit, you have to incentivize it. The data is there. Data, data does not lie. And I like when someone said that um, facts are stubborn things. Whether you like it or not, uh, you are entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. Um, the internet penetration rate is 38.7%. The success of the withdrawal limit and cashless policy depends on internet and telephone signals. And I gave the data earlier about the fact that there are less than 42,000 base, um, base transceiver stations in Nigeria. Lagos has 15% of it at 1.6 BTS per square kilometer. And there are places in Nigeria without access to telephone signals. There are places in Nigeria where cash is king. There are markets in Gweru, in Adamawa, in Mubi, in Adamawa. There are markets, um, there were no markets uh, in Kanu. There are markets um, spread around Nigeria where people pay cash for grains, people pay cash for cattle. People pay cash for leather. If you don't, if you don't, you don't go to those markets and tell them, hey, "I want to buy ten cows," and the ten cows is going to go for one point eight million naira, and you say, "Oh, an English," and he's like, "What is this one talking about?" You know, these are realities on the ground. The, now, a, a couple of weeks ago. The Nigerian Governors Forum agreed to slash the right of way charges for um, um, telecom companies for, by 90% from 145 naira per kilometer to 14.5 naira per kilometer. I think that's a welcome development. But the government has to move quickly. It has to move quickly, and the NGF has to work with the federal government, the NCC, and the Ministry of um, Communications, um, ICT, to ensure that they begin to incentivize companies to invest in broadband infrastructure and increase the coverage of BTS around Nigeria. And someone said that, oh, but banks will go open in rural areas. And I said, look, there's no incentive for a bank to open in a village. Banks open branches, set up um, um, ATMs where they prospect to get business. And this is where agency banking comes into play. We, we've seen that over the last few years, agency banking has been extremely successful and has done a bit in bringing some more people into the banking system. A lot of people don't go to the banks nowadays. They opt for withdrawing and making payments, paying bills through POS terminals. The cash withdrawal policy will in some way kill the agency banking model because the thing of either uh, withdrawing money or depositing money, it's going to be impacted by the withdrawal policy. So I'm sure the POS uh, operators through the PTSPs um, have submitted a petition to the National Assembly um, objecting to the actions of um, the Central Bank of Nigeria, the policy action. And you can see the fact that the resolution was raised and passed by the, National, uh, the Federal House of Rep asking the CBN to put a hold to the policy under matters of public um, urgency yeah, um, a few days ago. So the, these are realities that we have to grap grapple with. We cannot wish it into existence that cashless policy is going to be successful. You have to provide infrastructure to ensure that it succeeds. So this idea that, oh, um, after a while, the people are going to get along 
get on with the program. I, I, I don't buy that idea because if you don't provide the infrastructure to, to, to make sure that um, the velocity of money continues in an economy with rising inflation and lower purchasing power where people need higher denominations. I'm not asking the CBN to print higher denominations. I think that's going to be a terrible and horrible idea. Um, I'm not also saying that their decision to restrict the supply or reduce the supply of 500 and 1,000 iron notes is a bad idea. I don't think it's a bad idea, but they also have to consider that that restriction will reduce the velocity of money considering the um, level of inflation we have and the fact that inflation continues to go up and the purchasing power continues to reduce. Yeah? I mentioned before that at 21% inflation, for example, it takes three years and four months for the inflation to double and for the Naira to lose 100% of its value. That's the reality on the ground. So the, the, these are, these are um, um, data, uh, policy points, yeah, principles, financial principles, economic principles that the Central Bank of Nigeria needs to put into consideration as they charge along with this decision. I, personally, I don't think it's the right decision. I don't think um, if um, the central bank is saying that this is going to help to reduce vote buying at the next elections, I, I dispute it. I dispute it because I'll say it again, there is nowhere in the CBN Act where it says that the CBN is responsible for um, um, stopping vote buying. That, that is the provision of the Electoral Act sections 84, 86, 87, 89, 90 and 93 of the Electoral Act that was signed in 2022. The NFIU is there. The NFIU in 2018 became independent when the president signed an act to make them independent. They are tasked with providing suspicious transaction reports on terrorist financing for um, financial and non-financial designated institutions. My advice for the federal government is for the president, for the National Assembly, to increase the scope of the NFIU and take it just beyond terrorist financing to money laundering and other special crimes. Yeah? So that they can provide STR reports and coordinate with all the anti-corruption agencies, the EFCC, the CCB, the CCT, the ICPC, and the NATI and all of them to ensure that there is synergy. And, and this also brings into, into, into point that the, one of the major um, um, task of the next president, whoever becomes the next president of Nigeria, is to implement civil service reforms, implement the Stephen Orasanyi report where he um, said that it's important for the federal government to collapse the ICPC, EFCC, and um, CCT into one organization and reduce the cost. Yeah? It's their work to fight issues like vote buying, it's fight issues like money laundering and terrorist financing. The security agencies are there to give them intelligence. I, I also suggested when I appeared um, some while ago on um, STV that it's important for um, the Gov National Assembly to pass the Pre Political Parties Electoral Offenses Commission Act because the, the INEC and the EFCC do, don't have the technical and financial capacity to fight people who default on the Electoral Act of 2022. So if the CBN comes and says that they are trying to fight money laundering and vote buying, I will say categorically that they don't have the legal authority in the act that establishes them well, well, to do that. Well, Kelvin, Kelvin, I am not sure the central bank has come to say that um, they, I mean, categorically to say uh, that uh, part of the, the aim of the uh, cash um, withdrawal limits is about vote buying. But I'm sure uh, people are reading in between the lines uh, to come up with those um, uh, position. Uh, for the central bank. But then, Kevin, I think you have raised quite some, some interesting concerns which uh, we would have to build on in our subsequent conversations in the future. Uh, thank you so very much for your time, Kelvin. Kevin Emanuel, always a pleasure having you talk thank, to us thank on, you. Thank you for on News Up. Some salient concerns you've raised uh, this morning. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. All right, Vincent, let's, let's wrap up with you as quick, quickly as we can. A, a, parting, a parting statement for, from you on the entire conversation in 60 seconds. Vincent. Yeah, uh, my, uh, run, as a random power, I would just say that it's quite a period for Nigeria, and the government have some decisions to make which rest as we go for 
So it's expected that the government makes some bold decision and prioritize uh, the economy and the uh, what called the uh, the average Nigerians above their political uh, aspirations and political concern. So that because at the end of the day, if these issues are not well handled, it can lead to some security threats as it has been highlighted by the PSS. So something needs to be done. And uh, so that we can cushion the effect on the average Nigerian. And I think it, it starts from doing something about the for current forest scarcity. If you reduce energy costs, I will definitely start reducing the cost of food because transportation costs will be reduced. Thank you very much. Vincent Oshoma, financial analyst and head capital market interstate securities limited. We thank you for your time and thoughts on the program today. And the same also goes to you once again, Kevin Emmanuel, financial analyst. And that's it, gentlemen. Hope to see you again on this show where we'll be talking economy or maybe even on business today where you're most really seen all the time. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right, that's our package on News Hub today. We thank you so much. It's a Monday. And for those who have forgotten again, in case you're here to collect your permanent voter card, go to the nearest INEC office and get your card. Collect your card and get set to vote. Put your ears to the ground. Watch what's going on in the political scene so that you can make an informed choice come 2023 general elections. So that's the show. I'm Sharon Did you Good morning. Thanks for watching. And I'm David Ababadiki. The offices are open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. up until Sunday. Take advantage of this opportunity and get your PVC. Have a great day and bye for now.